The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Christmas. I almost said second Sunday of Easter. <laughs> no, second Sunday of Christmas. Um, on Wednesday, we'll celebrate the Epiphany, which is the celebration of the Magi who go to the baby Jesus. Jesus is revealed as Lord, not just to a few, but to all. Next Sunday is baptism of our Lord. We are glad, though, that we gather together today to celebrate uh, Christmas yet one more week. There's so many great hymns and so many great things to say about Christmas and about what Christmas can mean uh, in our midst uh, that I'm glad we get a second go at it today. Um, I'm going to leave the announcements for you. I'm wondering, though, if there are any announcements that are not the bulletin but should be made. No one. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, before then our opening hymn, I'm going to just say a brief prayer. So let us pray. O oh God, you call your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and love supporting us for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We'll now hear the first verse of Christ Be Our Light. Please rise as together we share in the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who was in the beginning, who makes a dwelling among us, who covers us with justice and mercy. Amen. God of goodness and loving kindness, we confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. We have turned away from your invitation to new life. We have turned away from the lowly and downtrodden. In your abundant mercy, forgive us our sins, those we know and those known only to you. For the sake of the one who came to live among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the good news of peace and salvation for you. God forgives us all of our sins, not through our own work, but through Jesus Christ made known to all people. With all who come to the manger, rejoice in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have filled all the earth with light that comes from your incarnate word. By your grace, empower us to reflect your light in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as together we hear God's holy word. Good morning. The first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14. Thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of, of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. 
See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path, in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a water garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young woman rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them, and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. The word, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Glory to you, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. Be our light, O Christ. Shine in our hearts in the darkness of our lives. Shine, shine, shine. So that even for just a moment, we can see your presence among us. Even in an instant, we can receive grace upon grace. Even in a piece of bread or a thimble full of wine, we can know that your love 
is not a myth, but is, in fact, the truth. Thank you for your love that sustains us each and every day. For the sake of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I'm wondering this morning, brothers and sisters, how many of you have engaged in the most sacred act of the season of Christmas by bringing, by returning Christmas gifts that you received and that you wanted exchanged? Anybody in our, nobody dares raise their hand? Yesterday, uh, my wife and daughter and I were out and about doing some things. We had a lot of errands to do, and we had to stop by a store that, where we had to make a couple of returns, and I felt pretty good about that because I thought that would mean that I'd get to take a quick nap in the car until I realized it was my card on which the gifts were purchased. So I had to go into the store because I couldn't just give my card to my wife. I had to be present. So I walked in the store and of course there were many people returning gifts. And to each one, the person who was working asked this question, why are you returning this? I mean, I didn't want to answer that question. I didn't want to go through the whole litany of how my wife made me get out of the car and take these gifts across the parking lot, into a store, stand in line. I didn't want to say any of it. So I was looking for creative ways to kind of talk about why I was returning the gift that I would return. The person in front of me said this, Well, sure, I wanted this, but it's not what I expected. I thought, that's brilliant. Uh, Not just as a response to, why are you returning this? But as a response to what it means that Jesus has come to us in the way that he has as word made flesh, the way that Jesus has come to us as light, shining in the darkness the way that Jesus has come to us as full of grace and truth, as Jesus has come to us grace upon grace, as Jesus becomes flesh and dwells among us, which really is better translated, um, sets up camp among us, moves next door to us, comes into our house and sits in our living room even beyond beyond our welcome of him, the one who sits at our dinner table until every last morsel is eaten and then still sits there with us, the one who is with us morning, noon, and night, the one who is there even in the middle of the night, the one who is with us even when darkness encroaches For he is the light that shines in the darkness, a light so bright and so powerful, darkness did not, could not, would not overcome it. Oh, sure, we wanted Jesus to come into our midst, but we didn't realize what that was going to mean. How many times do you think people have thought that over the span of human history? Oh, how we have longed for Jesus' presence. And then, oh my goodness, this is what it actually means. Can Jesus go elsewhere? I didn't realize what I was asking for. These words from John's Gospel open for us the reality of our lives. He has come to us, but we did not receive him. We did not want him. 
oh sure we did want him and then he showed up and got all up in our business and then we weren't so happy about it jesus go bother someone else we might think but we'd never say because we're lutheran and what would that do to us if we said such a thing out loud But why would we send Jesus away? Why wouldn't we want him all up in our business? Maybe we grew up in an era where we didn't really talk about what was going on with us. Or worse, we grew up in a home where we don't really talk about what's going on with us. Or worse, we don't have anybody in our home with whom to talk about how things really are with us. And maybe we don't, not only do we not have anybody at home, but we don't have any friends. And right now, in the midst of COVID, we don't even get to see those people, talk to those people. Maybe we have forgotten how to tell Jesus what is going on with us. Last night I got to talk with one of my very best friends in the world, Matthew. Now I'll probably talk about Matthew several times in my span of time here. So let me give you a picture of who he is. Matthew's over six feet tall and he is a pencil. He's the width of a pencil, very thin. And as tall as he is and as thin as he is, he is equally as quiet. So you can understand how he and I are just right alike, right? How we're absolutely alike. In opposite world, <laughs> we are very different individuals, but we met through college. We met through Lutheran campus ministry at college. And in that time together, we became very, very close, and we've been close ever since. Well, Matthew and I talked on the phone last together last night. And we hadn't talked since before Christmas. And usually conversation is really pretty, pretty easy between us. But last night, he was making cookies and I was dealing with a five and a half year old. I was dealing with a five, I was dealing with a five and a half year old who wanted her way, thank you very much. So it wasn't the best of conditions with which to talk, in which to talk, and yet we had a conversation, and it was kind of weird. But we realized that what made it weird wasn't that we didn't want to talk with one another, but maybe that because of the world in which we live, we had forgotten how to talk with one another because we live in a world where there's not a lot of talking for we're all masked up we're all silenced and if that's true between very best friends how much more is that true between us and God the one who is closer to us than we are to ourselves as St. Augustine said it. The one who knows right well what is going on with you, even before you whisper a word. The one who knows your highs and your lows. The one who knows where you rejoice and where you grieve. The one who knows where you are right now because he has promised to be your God, has promised to show up in your life, has promised to be there to love and forgive, to heal and accept the one who has promised that at last breath, when you take that last breath, you will then breathe in the fullness of grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. For Jesus has died for you and been raised from the dead for you, and because of that, we have hope. Still, it is not always easy to remember that we have hope. 
for any number of reasons. <coughs> maybe maybe uh, Christmas was not the most wonderful time of the year for you. Or maybe this part of the year is not the most wonderful time of the year for you. Maybe you suffer from seasonal affect disorder. Maybe you suffer from anxiety and depression. Or maybe you're terminally grumpy. Any of those people in here, those who are terminal, like grumpy, like as a, as a, just their way of being, they're just grumpy. Is that true of any of you? None of you? Okay, that's helpful. Maybe the reason Jesus feels so distant from us is that we have moved away because we're afraid maybe of how Jesus will respond, what Jesus will say, and what Jesus will do with us. What will Jesus do with us? Still, though, Jesus will not have that be, it, be the way it is between us. Oh, we may try to move away. We may try to hide our feelings or hide our pain or hide our frustrations or hide our anxieties or hide any number of things that is going on with us. And still, Jesus finds us where we are and takes us upon himself because he is our Lord. What he will do with us is love us, forgive, heal, save, reconcile, make us new. And maybe that's what scares us the most, that Jesus will make us new. I mean, I don't know about you, but I never mind. I think change is a great idea when it happens to somebody else. Not always so much when it happens to me. And believe me, I've made a list of people who need changing. And I'm not on that list that I've made. Amen? Yeah, I mean, you all have a list, right? And you all know why they need And what's so amazing is that insight's been given to you, but apparently not to that one. And so they don't know, but you're aware that they need change, right? It's okay, though. Because as much as we think we see, Jesus sees even more clearly. And it doesn't just come to change those on our list, but also us. Also us, making us whole and new. We might say that we've never seen Jesus. We don't know what he looks like other than a painting. We, we have no idea what his voice sounds like. But, you know, if we pay attention to cartoons where the voice from above comes and it's booming, oh, I'm Jesus. You know, it's really loud and obnoxious. Um, still, though, Jesus comes to us and for us. It's interesting that the gospel writer John uses this image of uh, the word uh, became flesh and lived among us or dwells among us or sets up camp among us or builds a house among us or to give us a sense that Jesus really doesn't just stop by for a cup of coffee and a cinnamon, cinnamon roll. Instead, Jesus shows up and makes himself present in a way that is full, in a way that is free, in a way that is lovely and beautiful and surprising. Jesus does this because he is your Lord. In a few days, if it hasn't already happened, in a few days your Christmas trees will go down, your wrapping paper will go away, and the things that you received at Christmas will blend in to all the other things that you have. And you'll sort of go on your way, and 
live as if, sure, we celebrated that, but that's done now. But Jesus' presence with you isn't something that's here and then gone. It is here. It is never finished. It is all, Jesus is always here, always listening, always gifting, always accepting, always loving. And I should say to you that you know how people expect that things change between us based on any number of circumstances? Well, we liked him, but then he did this. Or she was wonderful, except for in Jesus' eyes, there is no exception. There is no limit. There is no boundary. Jesus has come to love you fully for who you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. No matter where you've been, Jesus has decided that you are his and he is yours no matter what. As we move into the season of Epiphany, we'll be looking for signs and wonders of ways in which Jesus shows up in small ways, in in ways that sort of surprise and delight. I can think of no better place to start, though, than in a piece of bread and in a cup of wine. In, through, by, near, around, Jesus shows up and promises new life for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please rise and together let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need in all of God's creation. In the silence and in the song of this place, Lord God, we thank you that you promise to be present, that you promise to show up, that you promise to meet us as we are, that you promise to love us unconditionally. Transform our hearts, O God, so that 
we may love as you love. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In our world, O God, there is such need of healing for any number of reasons, not just medically, but otherwise. And yet, God, you promise that you have all things in your hands. And so into your hands, work your healing and your new life so that we might be restored to you and to one another. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Gracious God, we remember before you today those who are ill or hospitalized, especially Ron, Clarence, Yvonne, Sandy, Milton, Norm, Don, Renata, Brian, Warren, Tom, Tom, Roger, and Judy. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord God, that you promised to never leave us orphaned, that you are always and everywhere with us. And so be especially this week with those who are homebound, especially Zelda, Lucille, Alvin, Flossie, Milton, Ruth, and Gail. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. In the book of Romans, O oh God, you speak in a way that helps us to know that even in our sighing and our crying, you are there with us. Even in our grief, you are there. So we ask your presence of comfort and peace upon the family of Leonard Haas. Help them to know your love and your mercy in these days. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We thank you, God, for those who are serving our country, for those who stand up and enter into messy situations and circumstances. Be especially with Jordan and Richard and Joel and Andrew and Tina. Hear us, O oh God. Gracious God, I ask your presence with this congregation as we look into the future, as we imagine what you might be calling us to be about and which direction to turn. Help us to know your love and your guidance and your care. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. All of these things and whatever else we should ask, we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You all may be seated. At this time, we would normally be collecting our offering. And so I want to take a moment to say thank you for the ways in which you partner with us, that we partner together in the work of mission and ministry as a congregation. Through your, through your giving and your care, we are able to reach out with the love of God in ways that we could not otherwise. And so for you and for the ways that you walk alongside of us, we are grateful. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to take out your communion elements.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. Giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the memory of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In, with, through, under these gifts, Jesus becomes known to us. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus is with you. pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us from your very self with the body and blood of Christ. Through this mystery, send us forth to proclaim your promise to a world in need. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.